Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? How is everyone doing today? Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you taking time to share um, these ideas with me and to I look forward to a um, interactive session. So I welcome you to um, share your questions or points as, as, as and when you see them. So the title of my talk today is Time for Disrupting the Status Quo, Case for Diversity in Open Source. So we will talk about diversity in open source and we will talk about you know, what is going on and what is the need of disrupting things, what we want to do as we go forward. Um, So my name is Vandana Singh. I am an associate professor at the iSchool at University of Tennessee. Um, I have about uh, 20 years of research experience on open source software. I have looked at a variety of settings, variety of issues in open source software. My dissertation research from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign was also on open source, on users of open source. Uh, recently, I have been working um, on diversity in open source software. I've been specifically focused on experiences of women in open source software. And so I would share some of those things with you. If you would like to know a little bit more about uh, me, then um, here is the link to my website and also my email is here if someone would like to get in touch with me or ask questions or collaborate or, or you know, whatever um, you might want to share with me, uh, then my email is right there. Um, before I go deep into my talk, I would like to um, address and acknowledge that we all are going through you know, the global pandemic, COVID, and um, everybody is dealing with a lot of different things. Um, and so I would uh, share with you that I am originally from India and, you know, right now India is going through a horrific second uh, wave. Um, and so we are all dealing with a variety of, uh, you know, issues. So please be uh, cognizant, empathetic towards people who you might come across who are either from India or from anywhere else. This is something that's happening everywhere. So I would just request you to be compassionate and show a little bit of empathy to your colleagues, to your coworkers, to your mentees, to people who you're working with. Um, because this is, uh, you know, personally, you're just all seeing for myself, I have in the last week heard of so many um, deaths and COVID positive cases and lack of resources. So just wanted to put that out there and just share this space in a little bit. So, um, you know, um, issues that anyone might be facing. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and not, um, you know, not think of our existence as being in, um, in vacuum of those issues. Um, Oh, uh, someone said question mute with Rafael. Um, I, I don't know how that might have happened, but you can unmute if you have something to say um, and or if you would like to share something with us or you can type it in the chat as well. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, go ahead and um, talk a little bit about, you know, what the outline for the talk today is. The first thing I would like to say is that I would really encourage uh, you all to participate in it. I would like it to be an interactive session. Um, I will share things that I have uh, to share. Then I will also um, ask for your input. So please do participate in the input and, and you know, uh, share your thoughts on it. Uh, I'm really pleased to see the increasing number of participants. I think that's a very good sign that um, you know, this is something that people consider important. So, so the way I want to talk today about this topic is you'll get started with uh, diversity in OSS. Uh, why bother? Why are we here? Why, why should we think about it? Why are we talking about it? Why is it important? So we'll go get started with, you know, some definitions and stuff, but then we will talk more in depth about uh, why is it important? Why is it important that we care about diversity, equity, inclusion in open source software? 
Uh, then I'll share, um, as I said, I have about 20 years of experience of doing research in open source software. I will share some of my recent work in uh, uh, women in open source experiences. I'll share some of my, um, uh, you know, uh, key takeaways from a few of my papers, but more specifically, I will uh, present some actionable res results from that research. Uh, you know, what are the things that I found and what are the things that we can take and take actions on? Um, and then we'll also look at what is going on around us. You know, what are the um, um, current diversity uh, initiatives that exist in open source software? And some of you uh, might know more than me on that because you might be involved in that, uh, in those issues, in, in those initiatives. So I will welcome your input in that aspect also. Uh, and then we will look at, you know, these initiatives exist. What are the challenges? What are the challenges that people face or we face as a community when we talk about issues. And then what can we do about it? What is the way forward? We have, uh, you know, we, we know diversity is important by the point we get to this thing. We are talking about what are some of the actions we can take? What are the further things that we can take? And, and I will count on you. I will ask you, I will put you on spot to make commitments of what will you do uh, to make a difference. So we will, we will talk about what can we do as individuals? What can each one of us do? And then we will also think about what can communities and community managers do? What can be done in order to, uh, to make a difference, to move the needle. So that's the plan for today. And uh, um, like I said, feel free to ask questions or um, just post them in the Q&A channel, or if you have a quick thing that I could answer. Also, we will have these breaks. So at any time, you know, feel free to communicate. Um, you have something to share. So with that, I would like to start with uh, some definitions. We are talking about diversity, um, equity, and inclusion. What, what does it mean? How do we define? How is diversity defined? And this is, you know, a little text heavy, so please bear with me. Um, so diversity is essentially used to describe differences. It is used to describe individual differences, and it is used to describe group and social differences. Individual differences can be about your life experiences, what you have seen around you, how you learn, what do you like to um, learn, you know, are you a visual learner, are you a um, auditory uh, learner, um, what are your working styles, are you an extrovert, are you an introvert, and then also the broader concepts of group differences or social differences. So, you know, the race, the socioeconomic status, the class, gender, sexual orientation, abilities, country of origin, intellectual traditions, cultural, political, religious. So essentially, in a nutshell, diversity is when we when we are talking, when we are using the term diversity, we are talking about differences. Differences among people, they could be at individual level and they could be at group level, they could be at country levels, they could be at racial levels. So we are talking about diversity, we are talking about differences. So it just establishes that there are differences. Then we have to talk about inclusion. So knowing that there, there are differences is good. It is important to acknowledge and appreciate and, and you know, to say that, yes, it exists. These type of differences exist among us. We are not all the same. Then the inclusion term comes in where we are making an intention. So that is going to be one of the things at the end of the session I will ask you to do is make an intention, make a commitment to engage an active intentional engagement with diversity, with these differences that we see. So we see the differences and then we commit intentionally to engage, to acknowledge, to appreciate these um, differences. How do we do that? How do we engage with these differences? And when we talk about that, how do we want to engage? So, okay, we want to provide resources. That's where the concept of difference between equality and equity becomes very important. Um, and you will hear this sometimes, you know, some of you might be very clear in what the differences are and some of you might not be. So just for the sake of clarifying the definitions, I wanted to present this um, image and this definition of equality versus equity. Equality talks about giving everybody the same resources. And equity talks about giving everybody the resources that they need so that they have a fair chance at a fair outcome. So this is distribution of resources in 
in the perspective of what is needed. So you can look at this picture, right? You see the little um, baby in the purple shirt. If we are doing something that is equality wise, then this is what we're doing. We're giving them all the same treatment. We're giving them all the same resources. Well, the poor baby doesn't have a chance to look at, uh, at, the, at what's going on in the game at all if we do that. So equity is giving them support that they need so that they have a chance, at least have a chance at a fair outcome of whatever is going on, there is you know, fairness in that. So that's one way of looking at, at these definitions. Um, there's also this really fun um, uh, example uh, that uh, is from University of Michigan Diversity um, Center that I really like. So diversity is where everyone is invited to the party. So everyone can come, we're inviting you, you're here and we acknowledge the differences. Equity means that everyone gets to contribute to the playlist. So everyone can say what is going to be the music in the party. So you know, all like a potluck, everyone can bring different things. Um, but inclusion means that everybody has the opportunity to dance. So there is this is further engagement. This is intentional further commitment engagement. Um, yes. So you know, thank you, Kyle, for sharing that. Um, so the, you know, this is the opportunity that is given to everybody, so that everybody has the same um, chance at a fair outcome. So that's the base level, you know, this is the base level understanding of what diversity, equity, and inclusion stands for. Um, with that, so why is it important? Why is that diversity, inclusion, and equity important? Why should we bother about it? And then specifically in open source software, why, why is that important? I would like you to think about it for a minute and we're going to brainstorm. So we're going to use a Jamboard and the link is right here. Um, if you could please share the link to the Jamboard. Then I'm going to pull it up. So we will take about, let's say about five minutes for everybody to contribute to this Jamboard. I would like to see uh, what you think. Yes, Neil. Yes, more outcomes that are more effective for everyone. Absolutely. So if you could go ahead uh, and use these uh, sticky notes like this, and then just post what you want to say. So here's the sticky notes. You can use those. And um, yes, yes, Bianca. <laughs> A diverse set of contributors can bring more productivity to the team. Absolutely. Very good point. Several approaches, yes. More empathy, yes, that is correct. To get a variety of thought processes, yes. How does that help us having a variety of thought processes? What does it get us? Software is more secure since neurodiversity yields better results, exactly. Very good, yes. If we are not diverse, we are missing enormous swaths of the population as potential contributors, employees, e even users, right? Like, you know, if you're not more inclusion. Different backgrounds can get different approaches. In software, diverse opinions can better target a wider net of users and invite them, exactly, invite them to use your products. More diversity means outcomes are more effective for everyone, exactly. Exactly. Diversity improves the working experience even for the existing community members. Yes. Different backgrounds enable us to tap into different um, approaches and to ensure that open source is open to all. Yes, very important. It's our philosophy. It's the philosophy of open source movement. So why would we um, want to block it for a certain group, right? to ensure so, yeah. impossible for design for what you cannot understand, impossible to design for what you cannot understand, yes. More diversity means better cross-disciplinary integration, design better products, designing a product in US for people in Africa doesn't work without participation from users, real users, absolutely. That's why so we see so many products failing because we don't know about the end users. More useful software for everyone, yes. 
diversity means we are closer to what the real world looks like. Yes, exactly. Yes. Open source is a driver in science and diversity of thought is critical to benefiting all people and cultures. Yes. Yes, that's very good. Unbiased software, fairer experiences, better opportunities. Yes, that's how open source works. It should be open. Learning and collaboration means we grow as human beings. We are challenged. Yes can help to improve the accessibility of the project to different audiences. That's a very, very important point, the point about accessibility, because that is really going forward is, is it has to be more of a priority than it has been so far, is to make everything accessible, make products that are accessible so that people, neurodivergent people and people with all kinds of accessibility requirements are able to use tools, yes. Diverse set of contributors can bring more productivity to the team. Yes, diversity increases productivity like Bianca has just shared a, a link. There's also a, a link that I'll share in a few minutes about from uh, Harvard Business Review, which did a study on different groups and found that if the groups are diverse, then the productivity increases. And we grow both our contributor base and our user base by bringing a larger pool of people into the process. Yes, complete and better thought out solutions. Yes, think more. This is open source for everyone, no matter who are you and where are you from, it is for anyone and anyone should be able to work together on the project. That's excellent. That's a very, very good point. Attain and retain talent to contribute. This is lovely. Thank you so much for contributing. I'm, I'm really pleased to see all this and uh, we'll be making uh, you know screenshots of these and then um, making these available as part of the slide deck. This is wonderful. Group think rarely leads to the best solution. Yes, <laughs> that's exactly what it avoids is the best solution. Diverse perspectives lead to improved solutions. Everyone wins and wins more together. Yes. Diversity means less people will feel lonely and more people will feel represented and representation matters. It is very important to see people like yourself it's very important for all underrepresented minorities to see someone like themselves being represented in the environment in which they are working. It's the right thing to do. Yes, it is the right thing to do. We are running out of room. Okay, so this is perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you for participating. This is wonderful. Um, yes, and if I missed reading any, please go ahead and read your, uh, read your uh, what is it, the sticky note. Did I miss anything? Otherwise, we'll, we'll get back to the uh, presentation. Okay. All right, perfect. So thank you. And I'm going to just uh, close this uh, window so that I can be back on the presentation. And then of course, I'll come back this, to this again also. So th that's, we've seen so many examples, right? We've seen so many things of why it is important. It improves productivity. These are all excellent points that we just saw. So you guys are already very, you all are already um, very aware of why it is important. So we'll put a screenshot of the Jamboard right here and later on, but just some quick statistics about, you know, kind of uh, getting deeper into open source software. So overall, women make about 51% uh, of the US workforce. More than 20% 20, 20 of the tech workforce is women, which is not very high. You know, we have to, we are working on it. We are working on it for decades to improve it, but we're not going beyond the 20 to 30% numbers. But the less than two to 3% of the OSS community is women. That's, that's really very, very, very low and also very shocking to a lot of people, but that's the reality. And for decades, these numbers have been stagnant. There have been opportunities, there have been things, there have been initiatives for about 10 years, but seems like we are really not moving forward. We're not getting more women participating in it. So two to 3% is kind of the average of all the different statistics that I found. I found something as extreme as 1% and then some things which are five to 6%, but nothing, no no, nobody says there's more than you know six percent, five percent women in open source software. So two to three percent of women. Why there's fifty percent women in the workforce? If we say it's just about technical skills, there's 25, 26 percent in in the technical workforce. So what is going on with the open source environment? What is going on? Why are our numbers not very strong? 
So let's look at some more reasons for why diversity in open source software. Like I said, you know, it look it doesn't look very good. I don't know why. We have to think more about it. We have to find out why these numbers are where they are. They look pretty horrible. Um, and the experiences that we hear about, the anecdotal experiences, uh, even empirical research, what we hear about is that people's experiences are mostly negative. We hear a lot about that. They get a lot of press. Um, the bottom line is hurting, right? There are more and more jobs in IT, but it seems like we don't have enough qualified people. And then we have qualified people, but for some reason they're not participating. So we do need to fix that, right? We need to make sure that that doesn't keep on happening. And like you all said, diversity is great for innovation, multiple perspectives, people with different perspectives when they're there. Um, it improves productivity, it improves innovation. Supporting diversity is in favor of creating innovative software. And who doesn't want to create innovative software, right? If you want to create innovative software, then you should have diversity in your projects. And if it's not there, then you need to commit to it and you need to do something to fix that. Also, I think that point was also mentioned somewhere there that women use the software, right? Uh, I'm reading Jim's comment. Women are but one group underrepresented. African-Americans, Indigenous, Latinx, and other also not at representation levels that would be appropriate. That's exactly correct. And so, you know, I will talk about some of the statistics in terms of underrepresented minorities, which includes a lot of, you know, these groups, which absolutely are not at any, you know, <laughs> levels of acceptable numbers. Uh, but, you know, some of the work that I have done has been focusing on women. But as soon as I entered that area of research, I immediately realized what you're saying, Jim. And, and it, you know, um, I am broadening my scope for understanding. There's been, you know, uh, there's been very interesting um, differences when we look at just the women versus underrepresented minorities as a group, which of course, it's not a homogenous group, not neither is women a homogenous group. But still looking at these groups, there are differences, and we have to acknowledge them, and we have to work for improving diversity from all perspectives, not just, just from the women perspective. Um, and that's why defining diversity in all those differences that we saw is important. So, you know, the last point is if women are going to use it and that can be said for, you know, like it was said for people from Africa, people from India or people from anywhere are going to use it, it would be good if they had an equal say in creating it so that the products can be successful. Um, and again, this what that I'm saying can be said for anyone who is underrepresented in open source environment. Why would underrepresented minorities or why would women care? Why? Okay, you know, a lot of people say, well, they don't like it. They don't like the technology or they don't want to be working in these environments. Well, that's, that's not true, first of all, from the research that we have done either on education or in these communities, that's not true. Uh, but also there is this um, inequality that happens when we have less uh, women, when we have less minorities. And that is that all the benefits that other people who are participating in these communities, the benefits of participating in open source software, they are you know, devoid of those, they don't get those benefits. So we are creating rather perpetuating a social inequality that exists. So people who are in these communities are missing out on these benefits and opportunities of participating in OSS software. You know, in my early days when I, in, in, in early 2000, when I was doing research in open source software, the whole big question was, why does anybody do it? Who are these people who are contributing to, you know, what are the motivations of developers was a big question. And one of the big things that all the studies on that found is that the skills that they learn, the, you know, programming skills, the coding skills, management skills, the networks and connections that people make, the job opportunities that they avail because of being in open source environment. Um, they have a documented experience. So we all are aware of these stories of people who did really well, who created a very good open source software and were hired by a big company for big bucks, right? We have all heard stories about open source successes and people who keep developing new things. So there's a whole lot of benefits that come from participation in open source software. And by this underrepresentation, we are excluding a whole group of people from these benefits. Um, so that's why they care. That's why they would want to be in there or that's why they should be in there. Um, 
and for learning, right? Learning is very important um, in these communities. A lot of people join these communities just for the purpose of learning. So, so in, in you know, why, why diversity in open source software? In addition to the things that we have talked about in the previous slides and on the Jamboard, um, yes, so Shua is saying that um, open source culture offers the best work-life balance for women. And those are the types of things that, you know, we will talk more about is that those are the types of things that we need to make people aware of. We need to make people aware of what are the benefits and uh, also how we deal with the bad reputation. You know, there's all these stories of hostility, all these stories of, you know, an anecdotal evidence of, uh, of harassment, of misogyny, of discrimination that people feel or experience. Um, how do we how do we talk about that? Um, so we have seen research shows hostile, discriminatory, predatory experiences of women and underrepresented minorities. So we have to um, we have to do something about that, right? Um, I'm going to read Bianca's comment. Women's contribution are so are even more accepted than women's. Women do not join or leave OSS because besides learning, they are highly motivated by yes. Uh, social factors for the reasons for which they want to create. Yes. Um, yes, it is a combination of anecdotal and also empirical research. I will just, Gina, in a minute, share my own research where I have documented this. So I completely agree with you. And one of the reasons why I went into this research is because there was a lot of discussion of this just being anecdotal evidence. So I wanted to document it in empirical uh, high level journals of software engineering that this happens and that we need to address it. So I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, we must be aware of the privilege of free time though. Many historical underrepresented groups are disproportionately in charge of care work and other responsibilities that take away from free time for contributing. Absolutely, and that's why we have to find uh, solutions like Shua was saying earlier, we have to find solutions that work for people, that work for different groups of people and the benefits that they get from them have to be different. You know, go back, going back to um, you know, that slide about uh, equity, right? How do we make it so that everybody has a fair chance to get, get, gain those skills? Um, so I'm going to now talk about some of my research that I have done on this. Um, I will share a few of my, uh, my you know, papers and some uh, actionable results for them. I do have a list of all the uh, published articles on, uh, on my website um, and also current ongoing projects that are there. Um, so if you would like to, you know, the articles of course have a lot more details and right now I'm just presenting um, just presenting the key takeaways and what the study was about so that we can talk about more things than just my research, but how to move forward from what I have been uh, doing when I try to understand um, the experiences of women in open source software. So one of the first uh, papers I wrote about this, the title of the paper, paper is Motivated and Capable, but No Space for Error, Women's Experiences of Contributing to Open Source Software. So the methodology was surveys and interviews. Um, I conducted surveys uh, from, uh, you know, with women who are active in open source software. So one of the big things with this study is this is of the people of the women who are currently active in open source software um, and not the ones who had quit because that's another group that I was very interested in studying is, you know, people who leave. So this is, this is from the people who are successful in open source software. Um, Yes, I am not seeing the name, but I see the comment that you're very interested in seeing the research that looks across various types of communities to see if there are stark differences in female representation. Absolutely. My personal experiences show very few women in networking projects, but reasonable representation in cloud native projects. Okay, part of uh, it is surely self-fulfilling in that more women lead to more inclusive, lead to more women joining, exactly, yes but how to get it moving towards a critical mass in the other ones, in the ones that are more known for more exclusion, absolutely is, is important, yes. So the, your, your first line and this first line on this slide is the same thing that, you know, in, this, in these surveys and interviews, so I had 56, 57 survey and 11 interviews that I did. And all of the people, all of the women who I talked to talked about this idea, this concept of 
underrepresentation of women that and the feeling of isolation and that works two ways so there is a So this is this is uh, the, the, in this survey. It is self-identified. You know, it was I put it out as experience of women, and there were men also who participated in it. But the results that I'm presenting are self-identified um, women in uh, this. So I did not sort them through a program. This is um, people who said, you know, that that I am a woman and I am an open source, and I would like to participate in your study. Um, so the the thing about uh, Isolation, the feeling of isolation is not just about uh, that I'm the only one, but it's also one of the interviewees talked about that when I am in a room and I'm the only one, then I'm asked to be representative of all women everywhere. And they asked me, you know, this is one woman's perspective that we are going to use to, you know, so there is more need for a representation that, than a single person than on whose shoulder it comes to represent every woman. Um, Impacted by mean girl queen bees, women need to learn to support each other and recognize there is room for all of us. Absolutely. And also along with that, Kathy, thank you for sharing that. Along with that, I think we also have to very be very clear that woman is a big word. Women is a big word. There are, it's not a homogenous group, right? There are nuances, differences, individual differences, societal differences. All the diversity that we see at you know general population level is also then can be seen in, in these smaller groups. So that has to be a very important point. Um, yes, and if you're lonely, then you struggle and then you feel isolation, exactly. Um, yes, Rupa, that's a very good point that, um, you know, so the third point here is it talks about that, that coding is not the only thing that you can contribute. You can contribute in many different ways like documentation, UI, UX, and all those um, things. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, Bianca. Um, yes, Adam, so we, you know, the, I, I don't think I have anybody in this project, but I have looked at, I will share some more projects that have looked at a broader community sense. So. Um, this, this is just like I said, this was the starting of my looking into the diversity aspect because the two to 3% really bothered me. And then this survey and interviews I did with a very open mind of like, okay, what are the experiences? How do women themselves see their contributions? What do they think newcomers should be doing? What do they think the community should be doing? So I'll quickly go through this, um, you know, uh, slide and talk about, you know, one of the things that they talked about was the first experience. So that means that when they were introduced to open source if there was a person a welcome person or a mentor who helped them get into it it could be a person they met at a hackathon it could be somebody who organized a conference uh, session on that so mentors and safe spaces are very important it's somebody to help you with that but also in safe spaces so safe spaces can be these uh, college based or conference based hackathons or uh, get togethers of open source communities and then in online environments also safe spaces play a big role so it was very important that the first experience was critical and of course like i said these are the women who are right now in there. If somebody had a broad, uh, bad, after, you know, when finished the, when I finished this analysis, I knew if somebody had a bad experience, I didn't talk to them because they're not there anymore. So, you know, that's why going forward, I'm looking at that. So coding is not the, another thing that was very important that I honestly did not know before this. Um, thank you, Rupa. <laughs> yes. Um, I, for, I missed, I think, Shua's comment. So let me just scroll back up a little bit. Yes, Shua, exactly. Yes, exactly. And so one of the things in this uh, research that they talked about, Shua, and that's why, you know, was no space for error, but also the extra work that women have to do to justify exactly what you just now said, that you have to prove. So the example a, a woman shared was that if I write a patch, then I write a whole lost list of this is what I know, this is why I did it, this is why I think work, versus if a man posts it, he just says, here's the patch and it will work. So there's this additional work that women have to do and they're motivated to do it and they do it like Shua is just now sharing, but there's also, uh, you know, this extra work that they have to do. Uh, 
But again, going back to the another key thing for me was before I did this study, I did not think anything about codes of conduct. You know, I didn't, that was not on my radar. And in the study, repeatedly I had women saying that they look at codes of conduct, that they care about what codes of conduct say, and they look for, does it talk about gender diversity? Does it have ways in which if problems occur, will they be, how will they be addressed? So that becomes very important, right? Vandana, there is a question in the yes. question and answer box about with respect to welcoming contributors, did you ask about whether the experience was better in a face-to-face -face interaction or an online interaction? It, it, there was no difference in the group that I studied. I had examples of people who were uh, who met face-to-face uh, -face and who were introduced to communities face-to-face. -face. Uh, this was someone from, um, uh, I'm not going to say the country, but it's someone from a, a country in Europe. And then there were also online mentors. And in this case, they said if if they were helped to get into the community, if they were introduced to the community, um, it was it was good. So a good mentor was good, irrespective of where they were. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so then when I, uh, you know, when I understood this idea of safe spaces, then I thought, well, this is really important. We really need to know and create and support uh, safe spaces. Uh, online safe spaces um, is what I focused on in this research. Um, and so what, what, are, what my first question was, what exists, right? What is out there that can be say, ca called like a safe space or women only spaces? Now I will, um, I will put the disclaimer out there that all these spaces that I studied, which were women focused spaces. So they're not women only spaces, but they're, I, I started to looking at women only spaces, but all these spaces had very clearly mentioned that anybody who identifies as women or who sees the, themselves as underrepresented or even you know, doesn't see them as underrepresented are welcome to come and share in these spaces. So they were not exclusionary in any way, but they were, you know, they were there for underrepresented minorities to discuss things. And more often than not, there were women discussing things. There were you know, several examples of um, other type of things too. But the first question that I had was how many of these uh, online safe spaces do exist there? And what if they do, uh, what are the types and how many are there and what goes on in these spaces, right? Like if we want to create more safe spaces, we need to understand uh, which one works and which one doesn't. So what I did was I did website content analysis of, of, of about 355 um, open source websites. And what I found um, essentially was that there is no standardized. Um, yeah, Stefano, so that's what I, I was just saying that they were not exclusionary. Um, they were open. So they were not women only, they were women focused. Yeah. So, um, so the first uh, thing was just to get the lay of the land, you know, what, what, so there was no standardized space. There were some list serves, there were IRCs, there were blogs, there were Twitter pages of women related things. There were forums, discussion forums. Forums have been around for a long time. So that did catch my attention at this time when I was just doing this lay of the land. Um, the, what were the types of activities that were happening in these communities, in these uh, spaces, online spaces? Um, It's a long comment, so I'm going to take a minute to finish this slide and then I'll, I'll look at that. Uh, so the activities that I found happening in these spaces was um, things like increasing the visibility of active women. So if there are women, then how do we showcase successful women? So that's very important to, for people to see, like, you know, we talked about in the diversity slide, representation matters. If you see somebody who's like you who's there, then it, it, it is important. Um, connecting mentors, again, another very important aspect. Opportunities for collaboration. I'm working on this. Why don't you, um, you know, join me on this? Or I'm creating this event. Why don't you join me in this? Or I am uh, teaching this class. Why don't you take this class with me? Um, organization of events. Any events were being organized, then they were there. Um, educational opportunities, and then most importantly, for me at least, when I was reading them, uh, they became these spaces for social support. Right. 
So social support was what they were sharing with each other. So then I started, I wanted to look at it more in depth. So I wanted to look at what kinds of support they're offering each other. How are they helping? How are women supporting and helping each other? So what I did was I um, did forums content analysis. So, you know, forums going back to about almost uh, 15, 17, 18 years old. And I looked at all the messages in the women focused forums. Uh, so I looked across five forums. And again, the details of these studies in terms of methodology and data collection and all that is, is in, the, in the complete articles. So five forums, 10,698 messages uh, from 1,344 1, participants. Um, that's what the data set was. And I'm looking at it, still looking at it from some other perspectives, already looked at it in a bigger form of, you know, okay, what are these safe spaces doing? What are the types of activity there? How quick, you know, which topics generate most activity? which topics are, what type of support are women providing each other. So these, uh, these forums do work as safe spaces. In these spaces, women receive and provide social support, emotional support, informational support, and technical support, types of support that I identified within the messages. Uh, they help each other to succeed in the hostile OSS environment by sharing experiences, expertise, and opportunities. So if they are facing hostility, they are able to come here and talk and talk about how uh, you know, they can deal with it or even their frustration that this is too much for me and I'm going to quit. I'm not going to continue in this. Or I'm going to leave this group and I'm going to go to another group. All those types of discussions were there. Um, and in, in this study, rather than focusing on those experiences, I focused on, you know, how this helped them, you know, how the support was being provided. Um, and so in that way, I see these uh, women-focused spaces as safe spaces which foster gender diversity because women are able to support each other in the toughest of things, which could be, you know, these harassment issues, but also in technical and, you know, in basic uh, learning of how, how to do and what to do. Um, now, yes, 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 uh, Bianca, yes. So they tend to hide their identities and gender. And I will share something with you. When the, I did the first study, um, you know, I'm, I was really, that was such a catalyst moment for me when I did that first study just to see what's going on because I was bothered by the two to 3%. When I sent out the survey, I got a response from a woman uh, she emailed me and the IRB, uh, Institutional Review Board, uh, for ethical research. And she said, in your survey, you're asking um, what product I contribute to and which country I'm from. And by putting those two together, anyone can identify me because I'm the only one in my country who is in that product who is also a woman. Um, and the fact that she noticed that, realized that, emailed me, and was worried about backlash just broke my heart. What is her fault? What is she doing? She is contributing her intellectual input to this environment. She is giving her time, but she's scared to talk about it. She's scared to be identified. That, that just was, it was too much for me <laughs> that... And, and of course, I immediately revised my survey and I reached out to her and I said, I'm going to change this. I'm going to always present my data in, you know, um, in, uh, in categories and, and non, no identifiable information will be present. But that's a trigger for me. I will always remember that. And that drives my research in this area because why should she feel like that? She's contributing. It, you know, why should she feel that she will face backlash if she talks about her experience of being in this community? So I'm committed to that person and I'm committed in future to keep doing this, to help others um, see what is going on. And we will talk about some of these challenges of, you know, in, in way forward. So yes, the identity hiding. And another big problem with that identity hiding that happens is that they're not able to claim that expertise, right? They can't then, because it's not in their own name. So even if they have this expertise that they're learning within there, then they, and I'm sorry, I missed uh, Jim's comment, but it's scrolled too fast on my screen. I'll, I'll get back to it when we have a, a little bit of a break. 
So there are a couple of questions, Vandana, in the yes. question and answer. Um, the first one is why women workforce face these challenges in the OSS IT industry, in the work community. Do you know the reason behind it? Why they face it? Um, yes, we will look at what are some of the ways in which we can fix it, but also there, you know, the, the challenges that women face or any underrepresented minorities face, these type of challenges are based in, you know, oftentimes they are not about, you know, one of the first things we'll talk about a little bit later is in challenges is, is lack of awareness. You know, people don't know that other people are being harassed around them or they don't perceive it as harassment or they're not tuned into it. So they're not helping out in these situations. And so if there is one bully and they are bullying different people in different places, they're, key, they're able to do that and they're able to really mess up experience for a lot of people. Also, they prove to others that this can keep happening. So you know there are things that need to happen that are not happening to stop this type of things. And so these type of discriminations keep happening because there is no, uh, you know, I'm not saying they're not stopped at all, but we can do better. And that's why these type of harassments, these type of things happen. These are, you know, oh, sometimes these communities are not moderated very well. Sometimes there is just a very heavy presence of a particular group. You know, it could be men, it could be men from a particular place, and there is no place for, in their minds, there is no need for others. So one of the other findings from that first uh, paper was that when, you know, the capable uh, word in the title came from capable and motivated, the capable word came from uh, women reporting that I am a programmer, but when we go to an event, they want me to set up the table. So there is this, you know, subtle gender discrimination thing that is maybe unconscious, but you know, they're, that they're saying, well, I'll do the demo, but why don't you go set up the table? And that women deal with that. So why is that person doing that? I don't know if they're really doing it to harm the other person, but it could be a unconscious bias. It could be what they're predisposed to. Again, within diversity, we also have to understand that people have different perceptions, people have different perspectives. And so therefore awareness is a key thing. Awareness of this is going on, awareness of, and I will talk about that a little bit later again, come back to it. But you know, just the two to 3% number, I don't know if it shocked any one of you here, but a lot of people are shocked when I say in my presentations that there's only two to three percent women because they say oh no that that that's not true there's there's enough so it's I think what we can do about this is create awareness and make people know that this is going on and then hopefully this will happen less and I'm going to read Jim's comment the visible enforcement of any yes COC is critical the open source software foundation is going through this right now yes with our RMS exactly People are waiting to see what comes off it. We are, yes. And the chat threads of the community range from not a problem to a big problem. Without actions, a COC just becomes a worthless piece of paper. When and who will act on violations? There's a key indicator to reinforce. We mean it, we value you, we do not tolerate X, Y, Z. And I will talk about that in, in this article that I know what I talked about. You have to say, you have to spell, spell it out gender diversity, whatever types of diversity you are valuing, you have to spell it out so that you can say that, um, yes, the, the, the table set up thing, yes. So you have to say, we support these minorities and this is the type of actions we will take. So, you know, like I said, the codes of conduct thing was quite new to me, but then I started looking at it. And in this study, which is uh, just a page is copied here, the title is, Codes of conduct in open source software for warm and fuzzy feelings or equality in community. So is there any teeth in these COCs is, is essentially what I'm saying. And what I found out was not just about the enforcement, which is the critical aspect, but also the fact that there's not, uh, you know, there's not enough um, not all community or not all open source communities even have a codes of conduct. And then those of whom have it, a lot of them have copy paste, so it's not customized. Or they are called, if, you know, like 11, I think in the 28 codes out of 355 communities, we found 28 had some kinds of guidelines and they had 11 different names by which they were called. 
So some kind of standardization in that is needed. And the next slide has, you know, um, one of the organizations that helping open source community uh, come up with standardized codes of conducts that are customized. So customer important, they are important, but customized are better. You should spell it out, your support five minorities. And of course, enforcement, like Jim is saying, is critical. Uh, you, you have to talk about conflict of interest because in the uh, forum analysis that I did, so I combined the forum analysis with the codes of conduct analysis and the forum analysis, I picked up examples of where women were saying that the codes of conduct cannot be enforced because somebody in the community council is doing this, uh, you know, is, is violating the code of conduct. So we have to think about conflict of interest. We have to make the enforcement visible and we have to include women or underrepresented minorities in the governance. And I should be going faster than this because I'm just only at my <laughs> study right now. Um, and then there is the one study which specifically focuses on discrimination and hostility and it's not published yet. Uh, but it has a lot of quotes and examples and, and the damage that this kind of uh, misogyny that they face, this kind of, um, yes, more empathetic versus the other genders, this expectation creates, yes. Yes, so we're going to talk about allies just after this. So I will quickly go through this and go get to where uh, just a few action items just based on the research that I have done. One is create and support safe spaces for women. We need more of those spaces and we need them to be better than just the discussion forums. And so I myself am engaged in research in where we want to create much better, much fun, much engaged spaces with much more opportunities to do things. Uh, created and enforced customized codes of conducts, highlighting profiles of successful women and underrepresented minorities, facilitating mentoring and networking opportunities, engaging women in OSS governments. Those are five action items from different studies that I tried to come up with that I think are uh, you know, actionable things that people can do. Um, yeah. um, so we're going to now look at some examples and I'll go quickly through these. Uh, these are some examples of current initiatives in OSS space. So what are the DEI initiatives that are out there? And you might be familiar with some of that. You might hope you're hopefully also, you know, participating in some of that, but I'm just showing that to show that, you know, all that is happening, but that doesn't mean nobody is thinking about it, right? Yeah, what vendors are you with? Because <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you for sharing that, Gina. So there's the Linux Foundation. Uh, more will be, uh, you know, coming up on that. But this is the Software Developer Diversity and Inclusion Initiative. Um, there's, of course, on GitHub they have the diversity, inclusion, and belonging at GitHub. And one of the good things that they do is they consistently publish their uh, report on the diversity um, in in GitHub. So that's a very good thing, something to learn from for other communities as well. There is the um, open source diversity, which has projects and spaces and programs, different things. So if you are not aware of these, then here is just quick listing. I'll quickly go through them. You can look at this one, uh, Hyper uh, Ledger, the Civility and Inclusion Group is, um, uh, you know, engaging and participating with HBCUs, with Girls Who Code, Black Girls Who Code, different kind of organizations. So, uh, you know, having the initiatives plus uh, highlighting what you are doing. Another one, which is about uh, including inclusive naming and these are the participating organizations in that um, there is for AI inclusive.org for uh, building an artificial intelligence community which is more inclusive to everyone there's of course outreachy internships which um, I hope most of you are aware of uh, where they provide internships to work on open source um, there is all these different uh, places, TransHack, TransCode, Red Hat, Lesbians Who Tech, Django Girls, Linux Chicks, Chicks, Debian Women, Genome Women, Women in Drupal. So what does that tell us? That tells us our ladies, yes. Um, and that tells us that there are many initiatives. So I'm going to, <laughs> since we are doing back, back and forth questions, I'm going to skip this Jamboard. Um, so what that tells us is that there are many diversity initiatives and they are there and they are working and they're making a difference. 
Now, what is it that they face? What are the challenges that they face? And then how, what role do we have, right, in addressing those challenges? So let's, let's look at that. So some of the challenges that these initiatives or in general, the DEI initiative have problem, uh, problems with are lack of awareness. Like I said, people are not aware of what is going on. Lack of allies. So we'll talk more about allies. That is a very, very critical aspect of um, DEI initiatives. Yes, thank you, Jim, for that shout out. Yes, perfect, we'll talk about it, yes. Um, lack of positive storytelling. So like I said, it's very important to give stories of successful uh, women and underrepresented minorities, highlight them and project them and present them. Enforcement of codes of conduct uh, because of who is running the organization or just, just no interest in the enforcement of it. And then the current scenario that we are seeing in different places, some organizations, despite their extrovert, you know, explicit commitment to diversity, these initiatives also like they have this, we are committed to this, but then what they do in actions damages the community in a huge way. So we'll look at some of those examples. Um, so lack of awareness or maybe even denial uh, can be about the status of diversity in OSS. That's the first thing that I always deal with whenever I present in academic conferences, my papers. Um, yes, thank you for sharing that Rupa. So, you know, people always are, no, you're not right. It cannot be two to 3%. It cannot be that low. Are you really sure that there is um, there is that kind of hostility in the community. Are they really facing this? So there's this, you know, that is really, I, I, in my opinion, that's just lack of awareness. I don't think people are sitting out there saying, no, nobody's being, uh, you know, treated badly. And that's why we don't want to do anything, but it's just that they're not aware. So uh, increasing the awareness for diversity, increase about the value of diversity. Like we talked, we started the talk with talking to all of us about what, what would it mean? Why should we even care about it? What is the impact on the overall value of a brand and product? If you want users for your product, then you should value diversity because you don't want your users to be homogenous, right? Um, a lack of awareness about the level of hostility, discrimination, harassment faced. Um, also the impact that this hostility has. Now that is something that I'm working on and I've done you know, some research on how tragic it is for women to get, you know, rape threats, death threats in these online communities where they're coming to contribute, how it impacts some completely leave that community, some completely leave open source, some completely leave tech. You know, th that's what happens. And people who might be doing it in the moment don't think of the long-term impact that it can, it can have on women and then overall uh, in the inequality. So let's talk more about the allies. Uh, concept, right? So we face lack of, you know, we face this issue and so Rupa was just pointing that out earlier of, you know, lack of allies. For all of you who are here, I hope you want to be allies and you, we all need to be allies to others. Um, and never think about being an ally as something that, oh, I, I got it and I know what to do. But think of it as, as being a journey. There's an um, uh, organization called Better Allies. This is a screenshot from one of their, um, something they shared. So being an ally is a journey. Understand your privilege. Why am I privileged in this situation? Why is someone else, what is the difference that, give, that is giving me this privilege? Um, what is going on with others? What is happening? So, you know, that lack of awareness, well, let's flip it and say, we will be curious and we will try to understand what's happening. Uh, and you don't have to do a huge big thing. You can start with a single act. You be okay with making mistakes. Nobody is asking you to be perfect ally in the first go, right? You, you, you um, start with this idea of, I want to make a difference. I want to learn and I want to, if I even make a mistake, I learn and then I move forward. Keep learning and keep improving. And you know, it's not a one-time thing. It, is, it has to uh, keep happening. What are the things that allies can do? Allies can um, speak uh, the name of people who are from underrepresented groups and they are not around, they're not in a meeting, share some opportunities for them, endorse them publicly, say, you know, good job, this was good, you did very good. 
invite them to high profile meetings. So, you know, sometimes people are just excluded. Sometimes they're excluded because people who are inviting don't even think about them. And that's part of unconscious bias. So if you are aware of it, you can invite them. If you are thinking about, okay, have I missed anybody? Then you will, you know, you can um, be a better ally. Uh, share their career goals with decision makers. If you are in a position where somebody is asking you how, uh, you know, who I, am I going to promote or, you know, whatever decisions are being made, if you are aware of somebody's career aspirations, share those with the decision makers. Uh, recommend them for stretch assignments and speaking opportunities. Give them opportunities to share what they know um, and, and get some visibility, positive visibility. Um, another thing is amplifying stories. And that's not just about positive stories. It's also about negative things. So, you know, what we were, Jim was mentioning earlier, um, this one is the, the first uh, screenshot of a tweet is about Dr. Timnit Gebru, who I'm sure most of you are familiar with, who was um, fired from Google. And um, this is something someone tweeted after that, Sanjana Hototoa, that remember, don't be evil. If you see something that isn't right, speak up. And that's exactly what Dr. Gebru did. But then she was fired and all the people who supported her were also fired. So that is an example of uh, a, a ruthless uh, decision making by an organization that impact the impacts, uh, you know, the ripple effects, the reverberating effects of it are much more uh, higher than what they can see today and how much they're damaging people by doing that. Um, Another thing to think about the flip side of the allies thing, we want to be allies, but we also don't want to be performative allies. So we don't want just to be allies who can claim that they are allies by using certain strategies, but are not actually systematically examining processes um, that are, um, that are um, oppressing people. So we have to look inwards also that, you know, we have to make sure this recent, very recent study that I've shared here talks about performative allyship or in, in allyship when people are not looking inwards. So you can amplify stories, positive or negative, as an ally. You can raise voice in advocacy and you can work in enforcement of COC. Anybody who is part of a community sees something. It is, if there's a good code of conduct, it is not a big thing. It is not a difficult thing to say, what you're doing is violating our codes of conduct. Please don't do it. And that gives support to other people. The impact of others seeing it is very important. Um, and this is the RMS issue that, like Jim earlier said, we are all looking at it. Um, Vicky Brazil tweeted that um, what they did in 2019, despite, despite the well-known toxicity FSF announced on Twitter that RMS is returning to its board of directors, and that takes the uh, free software back to dark ages. It's really backstepping, doing things that are very clearly uh, recognized earlier. So what are the allies doing in this situation? This is example of allies amplifying these uh, negative decisions. So OSI, they gave out their own response. Um, Josh Simmons gave his own response. I'm shocked and appalled by the news out of Libre Planet that RMS, a known harasser, is returning to the FSF board. So, you know, that's very important. So what do we do, right? We see all these challenges. What are the ways forward? What should we do? We know these challenges exist. We know diversity is important. We know there are issues in things that we are doing right now. So what can we do? That's why I call this as a time for disruption. It is enough, right? Uh, it is long overdue. As a community, open source software um, needs to be prepared and ready for disruption. And we all can play a part in it. Uh, we all, I will call upon each one of you to commit to changes. Um, and so, you know, it is very important to disrupt this, to disrupt this cycle that is going on that is not serving people. And we can do it. So we ha you have to think, think about it now. I'll talk a few more minutes about something else and then I'll get back to you. What can you commit? Where is your commitment from minimum to maximum? What will be your commitment towards diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion in open source software? For myself, these are my commitments. I am committed to continuing my research so that I can keep publishing empirical evidence to increase awareness so that nobody can say this is anecdotal evidence, right? 
Gina, <laughs> uh, provide actionable results for OSS, giving recommendations that are not theoretical, but that are things that community uh, people who are community moderators can implement. Um, I also, uh, another big aspect of my research that I'm not sharing here is I educate my own students, master's students um, in uh, um, to OSS. In, you know, getting people in who can do all kinds of things, not just coding. I am also committed to developing formal mentorship alliances with OSS communities for my students and for anybody else who's interested. Um, yes, thank you, Bianca. <laughs> uh, I am also committed to disseminating my research at diverse venues like this right here. I always present at academic conferences, but I think the type of work that I do, I need to present it to people who um, who are most close to it and who can make a difference. And so, you know, the value for me is in diverse venues. Um, and then I'm, you know, committed to continuing my research and also supporting future development of safe spaces for women of OSS. And anybody who's listening to this or is here and is interested, I would be very happy to collaborate with you and continue and share what I have, you know, going on. So uh, please do reach out to me. Um, one of the things uh, that is very important is when we say we're going to do something. So we commit to doing something. Well, this, this is space that we're talking about. It has to be iterative problem solving. DEI is not a big bang approach. You can just do a big thing and be done with it. That's not how it works. You have to be consistent in our commitment and we have to continuously improve. So what we want to do for that is if we are committed for this disruption, if you all are committed with me for this disruption, then we have to measure it. We have to measure, is it succeeding or not? And so for that, what we will do is, what gets measured gets done. So we will define DEI dimensions that you will monitor. You will say, this is what I'm interested in uh, measuring. You will select metrics for diagnosing wherever you are in whatever environment you are in, select metrics. What kind of representation is there? The first step, is there diversity? You know, Who all is there? What is missing? How do we recruit what is missing? How do we keep people there? Very, very important. Um, look at the pay. That is a very good metrics to see how we are treating people. What is the pay structure? Who is getting what? And then once you identify those things, think about how are we going to prioritize them? Which is what we're going to work on? Uh, select uh, ROI measures to advocate future investment. The return on investment measure here cannot be about money, right? So that's why it's very important. When you are going to ask for money next year for these initiatives, you have to have these documented for the continued advocacy. So your return of investment measures need to be either one of those metrics that you see above or something else that reflects moving the needle. And that's how you can, in future, ask for more money. And consistently adapt these measures to changes in the environment. So for example, right now, going forward, we will have to deal with the long-term impact of COVID on people and their lives. Uh, the remote work situation, people working from home, people's children staying at home, all these things, as situations are changing, we have to you know, build these in into our metrics of, of diversity and of inclusion. Um, establish your baseline metrics, establish responsibility and accountability, publish the results. Like I said in the GitHub um, slide that publishing your diversity report and reaffirming your commitment is very important. Um, so you want to become aware first thing, the roadmap for this disruption. And um, seems like you all know a lot about diversity, but um, so I think you are already on step three. Uh, but if not, then that this is step one for you to be here, to become aware. And then you have to create awareness among others because you will need allies. You cannot do this alone. Then we commit to disruption. That's what we do today. And then we implement the disruption, we measure the impact, and then we improve and implement again. So with that, what is your intention? What are you going to commit to? And you can, uh, we will use the Jamboard again, the same Jamboard. And I will ask you all to either share your name or not, completely up to you. But you know, I would like to see what do you uh, commit to? So the Jamboard link, I'll share it here. And it's the third frame in it. 
and I'm going to open that up on the where is my jam board here so let's go to the third slide here and you can again use the post-its uh, the sticky notes and share your commitment <laughs> i am putting you on spot and then while you uh, while uh, that activity goes on would you like to feel questions in the question and answer box yes would you like me to read them or can you? Yeah, I can't see that. Okay, now I, I just opened the tab. Okay, cool. Okay, so Shilpa asked about uh, sharing the list of such safe spaces that you encourage women to start from. Yes, I can share um, documents. I can share also online resources and some of the other people in the uh, talk might be able to share that too. There are um, open source communities which are committed to diversity and which are very good uh, for uh, women or underrepresented minorities to start from. So yes, that resource is available and I can share it with you if you get in touch with me um, offline. I will share a list with you. Okay, Shilpa. Uh, Kyle, for inspiration about possible solutions, have you looked at other IP creator spaces with better representation? For instance, the electronic music community is an interesting comparison because it relies on OSS IP to create musical IP. I personally find SAMC history inspirational. Thank you. Um, that's a very, very good idea. Um, and you know, that's all, it's, it's very important for us to learn from what already is going on. Um, there are certain, even open source, the AO3 archives of their own community, which has been very successful in having a, a robust community. So I think um, I, will, I will note this down and I will look at this particular example also. But yes, that, I mean, that is the way forward is to learn from what uh, has worked and what has worked well, right? Um, while it is natural to focus, so thank you, Kyle, for that resource. While it's natural to focus on established open source communities, have you done any research in early stages? For example, do women start projects at the same rate and they just don't get adoption or is there a ga gap at the starting phase? That's a very good question, Alan. And no, I haven't looked at start projects started by women, but that's a very good, um, you know, future study thing for me to consider definitely. I think um, I think that, that would also be very interesting, even in like, you know, I've been looking at some of the venture capitalists um, and startup projects from uh, women are doing good or not. So I, I'm very interested in that statistics also. I think that's a great point um, to look at uh, the projects started by women and how they do, right? Yeah. Rupa, sometimes women, um, Shua, were you saying something? No, no, okay. Andana, go ahead. It just said there uh, Shua would like to answer, so I thought. Oh, I, I, I'm clearing the things um, oh, as okay. you are answering. Oh, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Um, Rupa, sometimes uh, women might have their commitment situation change and realize they might have to step back. That could be what is happening. Just try to reach out. Yes, yes. So there is some research about um, uh, from uh, CMU about you know the the women who quit and yes the changing dynamics and that's not actually that's not even just women based. Early on when I was talking about you know the people who were what were the motivations for people, it was also for men too. Like when they were younger and they had their first job and they didn't have families, then they were more engaged in open source software. So that's definitely an an element. That that is present there, um, you know, that responsibilities change and things change. And so people are not always able to commit in the same way. Yes. Uh, Jim is saying, when I'd like to hear how DNI works is woven into Academia, say computer science curriculums. And I'd also be very interested to hear if Academia has started a conversation about moving away from exclusionary terminology and moving towards inclusive language. Uh, would a CS101 talk about master slave still, or they are they using main, secondary, or alternates? Yes, um, not enough <laughs> would be my first, you know, quick answer. Uh, uh, but um, 
and you know, it, I think the the inclusive naming initiative is a great one that uh, I am all when I saw it, I already wanted to share it with it with other people within our organization. There is, you know, the terminology of how you want to refer to you. Those are the types of things that universities are right now uh, adopting. But I haven't seen much changes in curriculum, and I think that would be very good to see. Um, and that will only happen again with diversity being in uh, in you know computer science education in curriculums. Um, people bringing alternative um, alternative opinions there and alternative ways of doing it. So, you know, listening to your question here, I commit to sharing that um, with people in my department and other 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 places who I work with of about this concept of you know make sure that we are uh, uh, improving our curriculum in terms of terminology but in general what you're saying you know the um, the we are not doing very good with education right we are not doing very good with getting more women into computer science education and so one of the projects i'm working on right now in proposal stage is this broadening this idea of computer science education to maybe tech education where we include more people and more things so i think it, it, the concept needs to broaden but yes thank you for asking that Sevi, i also had the experience once that i tried to contribute but they were not going through my pull request answering my questions and comments i had the knowledge to improve what was lacking but it was just not happening so you didn't find the support that you needed right yes um <laughs> that's a good point jim i just read your comment yeah to revise all your books i don't like the books thing but sure i use a lot of open resources um, Tony, has Academia's awareness of open source affected the inclusivity of open source? Sometimes I find, at least in scientific software, some of the same power structures are regrettably transferred over to open source. Yes, you are right. Um, um, I mean, it should, right? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think like has it changed? I think it should. It should change, affect the inclusivity of open source. Uh, just even if it is by the fact that you know more people are able to join in from different places, um, and uh, but I mean I, I think the crux of that question is in, in challenging these existing power structures from being replicated. Like how how do we do that part? Is is the difficult part? Um, is there data that you can share how the positive impact for having code of conduct and enforcing them? Uh, Yes, Neil. So the article that I shared um, on my slide, uh, the Codes of Conduct article, it just got published in the, um, let me go back to it, in the Software Quality Journal. They had a special issue on open source software. So you can, you can look at this here, this article right here. And if you don't find it, just email me. I'll send you the article. How often do community projects actually want DEI in their project? Isn't it a natural push from a project that anyone who wants to contribute can? Can, can anything be done if project doesn't think it's valuable or is that just a fork target? Well, no, no, I, I think we need to push back. That's why disruption, the word disruption, right, Alan? Because Yes, there are projects that don't want diversity or they don't think that that is valuable for them. So we need to show them how it is valuable for them. That's why that awareness point, creating allies, especially creating allies in places like that. We have to show them what the value is. We have to show them what the value is. We have to show them how they and their product will benefit. And then, um, you know, so four type of things is what has been happening. We don't want that now. We want to stop it and make it, um, Yes, it's vandana at utk.edu. So it's V-A-N-D-A-N-A -A -A at utk.edu. Um, what other projects can we initiate that can create diversity in our communities and the World Society for OSS? Um, uh, projects as in like what kind of initiatives we can do. I think allies initiatives is a great one. I 
I really think we should be working on, um, you know, the actionable items that I shared. So I think the codes of conduct support the safe spaces. I think that's key. And um, I have personally focused on online, but I think safe spaces as a concept in person, as well as online, I think would be very useful, Bhavneet. How to measure contributions by advocates and evangelists? That's a that's a good question. That goes back to you know thinking more about the return on investment type of thing, right? That what are we, um, what is being invested and what is getting out of it? So um, I, I think we will have to look at Bianca. We'll have to look at the literature of uh, you know uh, influencers, so social media influencers, and how those things are measured and then kind of move from there and transfer that learning here, right? Mentorship and the mentoring initiatives are excellent, absolutely. And, and being aware, one of the papers that I shared earlier also talks about complexities that can happen in mentorship. Uh, you know, biases that we bring from our, um, you know, wherever we are from, whatever we have our, had our experiences, sometimes they get transferred into mentorship relationships as well. So how to be careful about that. Yes, Juliana, thank you. Yes, is there any other question? <laughs> yes, I I am still guilty of that, Lucas, of uh, saying guys, I correct myself every time, but you know, yes. Uh, thanks, ma'am, thanks, ma'am. Yeah, and it's important. It's important for us to be aware and it's important for us to fix. Uh, yes, you have. I completely understand what you're saying. I think I said one time to guys even in this talk, but yeah, we have to be aware because it does, um, and, and you know, sometimes people don't care about it, but sometimes people care about it. And so we have to focus on the people who care about it. And so we have to use inclusive terminology. Um, Thanks, mate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, uh, having inclusive language is definitely better. Uh, and, and we all should make an effort to have our language uh, inclusive. Yes. Yeah, I, I once Googled, you know, what are the other ways in which I can say guys, y'all just doesn't roll very effectively <laughs> from my tongue. So I, you know, I was interested in seeing that too. Folks, folks is fine, I think, right? Yeah, folks is fine. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think, again, like I said in that slide with the um, allies, you don't have to be perfect. You're making an uh, attempt and then you acknowledge that what I said, I didn't mean to say it. And so you can fix it, right? Uh, yes, I, I am not aware of a cheat sheet, Lucas, but that might be an, a good project to start, right? A good <laughs> Wikipedia page maybe there. <laughs> a good class project for my students too, yeah. I didn't get to look at the commitment slide, so let me go back to that. So wonderful. I'm going to take screenshots of these and present it, um, add it to our PowerPoint. But let me just ask, uh, are there any other questions? And again, you know, I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear from you on my email. It's again, vendena vandana at utk.edu. Um, and I would, um, I welcome uh, opportunities for collaboration and discussion and brainstorming. Um, so please get in touch with me. Uh, and commit to, now I will, I will read some of these for all of us to hear what this is, but um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, I think we have a few minutes, right? Five minutes, yep. Yeah. Um, trainings or workshop th that I recommend, um, there are from Sage Sharp, there are the codes of conduct workshops that they do. They are, I think, uh, very inclusive. 
um, you know, it's the same, um, let me share it again. It's the, this, this, this one right here, they have um, trainings of different types of diversity and inclusion. That could be um, one to look for. Yeah, yeah, Jim, exactly. And, and you know, I have, a, if you will read some of my papers, you will see how many of these are there. I'll, I'll actually share one, one thing with you all. This study, this is the study that has taken me a really long time to do. This is also the study that was most difficult for me to write because, you know, nonstop for a month or so, I was just reading stories of harassment and misogyny. So you can imagine how that can impact a person too. And I have written this and I have written this, I think in a very uh, good way. Yes, Juliana, it will be shared. And uh, this paper is still not published. It is facing, um, I don't know who the reviewers are, but it is facing a lot of, uh, you know, people don't want to it to uh, show because this one, like I said, different papers focus on different things. And this one just focuses on the misogyny and the harassment and the discrimination. And that's a tough pill to swallow. And so I'm getting this bounce around. I'm working on it. And the reviewer too is asking me to make so many changes that it dilutes the paper. And I'm not there yet. I'm not, I'm not willing to do that. So I might just even publish it, you know, just uh, um, open and not uh, get like publication credit for it. Because I think it is important because I have really gone through those 11,000 messages and picked up what the problems are and then analyzed them in a theoretical way uh, to understand the impact that women have and the consistency of it. One of the big things from this was this persistent normalized experiences. You know, it happens and it happens to so many women and they always, uh, you know, it becomes almost normalized, which is a trauma response, normalizing abuse, right? Yes, Perry, I will do that. Thank you. I, it, yes. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you. I appreciate it. And you know, I am publishing enough from all the other things that I will keep this one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This has been really good. I've really enjoyed uh, interacting with you all. And I hope, uh, you know, it, uh, I hope you will stick with the commitment that you made today. And also, um, yes, thank you for sharing that, Steve. That's that's uh, that's a very sad reality, but it's true. And you know, I have uh, met with people, and I have seen this. I was thinking, like you know, I have gone through all these eleven thousand messages and seen individual theses of how things have impacted. Um, and then you know, to just minimize it by what percentage was it of the total messages, or you know, so many were just me too. You can't say this was discrimination. Me too. When somebody says me too in response to a, 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 a abusive uh, message or whatever it was, instant abusive event, then that is an acknowledgement of uh, further harassment. But they said no, you cannot count your me too messages. So, anyways. <laughs> yes, Shilpa, thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. I appreciate you all being here. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Bandana, for everything and for this wonderful discussion. And thank you, everyone, for participating and joining and posting on Jamboard and it was a wonderful webinar. Just so everyone uh, knows, this will be posted to our Linux Foundation YouTube later today, the recording, and we will get the slides from Vandana and we will put them up on the Linux Foundation website by the end of the day today. So thank you all very much again. Yes, thank you everyone. I really appreciate uh, seeing you all and please do get in touch if you're interested in talking more. <laughs>